In the last several episodes, we had been taking a look at different ways that we can defend ourselves against advanced persistent threat style issues and also provide early warning and detection systems, possibly even gathering information that would allow us to remediate such a problem. In those episodes, I also made reference to the ability to perhaps intercept and respond to DNS queries, and this information also applies to the WPAD information that we had in a previous webcast. Now, I'll revisit that WPAD issue and demonstrate how this tool can be used to do that in a future episode, but in this episode, we want to take a look at how the tool we're going to examine can be used to deal with advanced persistent threat, other kinds of issues that may exist, and also be used potentially as a detection tool for finding unusual behavior and trends within your network. This tool makes use of a concept known as a DNS sinkhole. The tool was actually written many years before DNS sinkholes were first created and was really created in an effort to allow us at an organization to defend against users going to unauthorized websites, particularly sites of a uh, perhaps an adult nature or hacker sites, things of that sort, some peer-to-peer -peer networks. For instance, Nutella was popular at the time. So we devised this, this uh, solution that would allow us to automatically generate authoritative DNS responses to any kind of string that we'd like to. So I just want to show you some of the pieces of this, and then we'll actually demonstrate some of the tool in use so you can see what this tool does and determine if it's something you could use. For example, we have a, uh, a file here, first of all, a configuration file that would go into the slash etc slash DNS block directory. And this first file is a list of all of the things that are absolutely blocked, defined by Full, do, full domain name, fully qualified machine name. So if you put a, a DNS name in here and it matches exactly, it will always return an authoritative answer for any of these. Now, what answer will it return? That answer will be whatever's in the block web address file. So in this case, it's currently set to go to 192.168.20.20, though you can, of course, change that to absolutely any address you'd like. For example, one way that this could be used, even by a home user, is to position this in a place where it could vis uh, see your internet connection, and then have this return 127.001 for anything to do with ads or uh, um, web bugs, those kinds of things. So if you put in things there like the Gator sites, all of that stuff, you could automatically block that simply by referring to your own site without having to modify a host's file or keep track of it. But of course, the problem with using the absolute name is what happens if instead of just trying to go to uh, thepiratebay.org, what if they go to www.thepiratebay.org, or perhaps some other uh, aspect of that? Well, that's where this blocked strings comes in. So the blocked strings is not really regular expressions, but instead allows you to specify a substring that if this substring appears anywhere within that particular site name, it will automatically block that URL as well, or that DNS lookup. URL is really the wrong word to use here, though we often think of web pages. The reason is that this will allow you to interfere with any DNS lookup, whether it's for web use or anything else. Now, of course, especially when you use a substring, you could end up blocking things that you don't mean to. So, there's an additional file that allows you to specify domain names that you want people to be able to go to, even if it turns out that perhaps they make up a string that would normally show up in the block strings file. So we've got all three aspects. We've got complete domain names, substrings, and then allowed strings, allowed sites. Well, how does the tool actually work? Why don't I actually get it started here? And normally, of course, you would run this in the background, perhaps during a startup script. Once this is running, if I take a look, uh, and I should mention, by the way, that I believe that I already have, oh, no, I don't. Let me uh, see what I have in this window. Oh, actually, no, I already have it running over here. So it's already running, and it does not actually print everything to the screen. This is actually going into your syslog. So the syslog will contain messages that contain uh, several different things. First of all, if we try to go to something that's blocked, let's just pick a blocked string. 
So let's take a uh, bedroom. So let's try to ping uh, bedroom.com. Notice that my host is now trying to ping 192.168.20.20. What's really happening under the hood? Well, I also have a, or actually in this window right here, what I'll do is bring up a, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my keyboard here, bring up a, uh, a sniffer that I have running. Now, in the background, this sniffer is actually running on a Mac on this same network. And you're going to see a lot of these SOA queries, start of authority queries for local. Turns out that the Macs here seem to be very, very chatty, constantly asking for the start of authority record. I haven't yet looked into why that's happening. But we can ignore those queries. We're interested in the queries having to do with, with uh, this host over here. So I'm going to change that, that uh, TCP dump filter just a little bit so that we're only going to see DNS queries involving this host. 10.0.173. So let me switch back over to that Mac and I'll stop this and I'll instead tell it to go for port 53 and host 10.0.1.73. So now I should only see DNS queries involving this site, this host here. So once again, let's try to ping um, bedroom. Well, let's not use bedroom.com because that one has already been resolved and will be cached. Let's try a different name. Let's try www.bedroom.com. Again, I'm pinging that same host, but if I now look in the sniffer, let's see what we find. We see here that there is a query sent out to the local DNS server, and we see an authoritative response coming back from the DNS server. That's no big surprise. But here's the interesting thing. Notice that the answer that the, the DNS server is giving is actually another address, 68.178.232.100. Yet if I look on the host here, it was trying to hit the 20.20 .20 address. In fact, I can try this again. Let's, from this very host, let me uh, stop this and turn on my DNS query again. And I'm going to just open up a new window. And within this host right here, the one that's running the sniffer, Let's try to ping a similar site. Let's go for the same one. Now this one is actually successful in hitting that site. The reason is that I don't have the DNS spoofer sitting in a position where it can see the queries that are coming out of the, the Macintosh computer. But if I put it in, in line so that it can see the link, for instance, if we were to run this on our DNS server, or perhaps an intrusion detection or intrusion prevention system, perhaps on our firewall, not only would we have a complete record of all of the strings that come up, but we would also be able to block any hosts that we desired. Now, how can we apply this to APT? First of all, since every query that's created, for instance, if I uh, ping google.com, I'll see that I also get a record here showing that google.com was requested and what the answer was that came back. Or actually, I'm sorry, this is a reverse query going out to that particular address that was returned. So if I can see every query that was made, I could do some statistical analysis on this and begin to detect hosts that I've never gone to before, outliers, and that are changing quickly. So if I could track this down to single hosts, for instance, here's the host making the request, and noting the number of requests being made by the host and the number of unique requests. One of the things you'll notice about your users if you begin to chart this out, not that I'm recommending you do this to spy on users, but if you do this with users, you'll find that your users tend to go to about the same places every single day. For instance, if you were to look at my web activity and my DNS lookups, there will be some additional ones, but you will find that I always go to slash dot Grok Law, Google. I also spend some time at Taw and 9to5Mac, as well as the SANS website. Then the email and things like that will add some additional queries, but that's the primary places that I will go every day. You could even develop a profile to be able to identify a user just based on their DNS queries, and that information is stored in this log. If we do some analysis on that, we can now see any outliers for that data and begin to detect perhaps some fast fluxing that's happening with an infection where it's now using DNS names to find out what the, where the command and control servers are 
command and control servers that will always exist in this kind of a scenario because the goal is to suck sensitive data out of the environment. Being able to find those and identify the names would allow us to then respond immediately by adding those names into this kind of a block list so that all of our hosts are going to be defended rather than just the few that I'm, I've identified as potentially being compromised. There are again other things that we can use this kind of tool for, so in a future episode we'll take a look at how this can be used to leverage the same kind of WPAD attack we've discussed in Windows, and in this time, how to leverage that against other types of hosts running things like Opera and Safari and Firefox.